Well, Peter, thank you very much indeed for reading for us. And uh, as I mentioned last week, our subject, the subject that we're exploring over these few weeks is really the subject that lies right at the heart of the Christian faith, the death of Jesus. It is the key issue, if you like, in the Christian faith. And um, we've reached chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel. Uh, somebody came up to me um, earlier, actually at the end of last week, and said, William, um, am I right in thinking that you're working your way through Luke's Gospel? And I was very heartened as we've reached chapter 22 after two and three quarter years to realize that, uh, that the penny is, is dropping. And uh, so I thought I might just reiterate that this, this afternoon. We've reached 22. We're on the home straight. I feel we're almost kind of in the stadium at the end of the Olympic marathon and uh, approaching the finishing line. And we come then to Luke's passion and the crucial issue at the heart of the Christian faith. All over the world, wherever we find true Christians, we will find people who insist that the cross lies at the center of Christianity. And indeed, in this gospel, if you just turn over three pages to the uh, chapter 24, you'll notice on page 78 that after he has risen three times, Jesus stresses that his death had to happen. Verses 6 and 7, page 78. He is not here, say the angels, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified on the third day, rise. And then sentence number 25 across the page. Jesus speaking on the road to Emmaus, foolish one, slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And then over the page, number 45, Jesus again with his disciples, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to him, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So then, we Christians are taught that the death of Jesus is central to the Christian faith, that we can't properly understand or indeed explain the Christian faith to others without grasping the cross. But why? Why did Jesus die? What really did his death achieve? Why is it so essential and crucial? Last week we saw that his death was certainly no mistake. And back on page 71, number 22 at the top uh, of the page there in that first paragraph, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. And right from the turning point in the Gospel, back in chapter 9, halfway through, Jesus has been leading the way to Jerusalem even as he predicts his death. We can discount, therefore, those who suggest that Jesus' death was a terrible tragedy or a mistake or indeed that at the last minute somebody else was subbed in in his place. That simply doesn't stand up against the evidence. His death was planned. His death was meant. But we also saw last week that his death was purposeful, not just planned, but purposeful, that he died in order to establish his kingdom, to accomplish his rescue, and to enable a relationship with the living God. If you didn't, you weren't here last week, go back online, you'll be able to download the talk. Very important. And this week we have just one point, very simply, he died to serve us. You can see it stated in uh, verse 27 and then explained in verse 37 on page 71 and 72. There at the end of 27, I am among you as the one who serves. And over the page... 37, I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now let's take a look at both of these two parts of Jesus' statement that he's come to serve and unpack them for a few moments. The first has to do with the nature of Jesus' kingdom. He is the servant king. And the second has to do the with the necessity of his service, our sin. Let's start then with the nature of his kingdom. 
Uh, the disciples' dispute there in verse 24 is, in the context of the Lord's Supper, ugly, egocentric, self-promoting, and utterly normal. Verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was greatest. <laughs> we love to be first. Privilege rather than subservience is our default desire. We hate to be looked down on. Robert Peston tells us that top executive pay is decided as much as a consequence of needing to be seen on the same level as everybody else as true worth. Envy is the constant companion of every man and woman. One very honest senior businessman once told me that when someone else succeeds and pulls off a great deal in the office, something within him dies. That's a quote. It's very honest. And somebody said to me just yesterday, that bonus day in his office is the most unhappy day of the year. I guess for most. Why? Because envy, pride, and self-promotion is the constant companion of every man. And we find this envious desire to keep up with and lord it over others everywhere, just as it is in the boardroom, so in the secretarial pool, if there is still such a thing. Woe betide the new girl in the office who crosses the queen bee. Certainly it's present in Christian ministry. And ugly, petty self-promotion is a prev as prevalent a temptation in the church as anywhere else. Uh, one theological college student once in his prayer letter to us remarked, my desire to do well in the exams was driven as much by my desire to be seen to be better than my peers as anything to do with honoring God. Well, here is Jesus' response to our petty, self-promoting competition. It's there in verse 25 through 27. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Those in authority over them are called benefactors. Not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater? One who reclines at table? or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So then the kingly rule of Jesus will be as different to the use of power in the world as chalk from cheese. Our, our family is currently recovering from a bout, bout of Downton Abbey addiction. I'm sorry if that makes you despise me. Uh, <laughs> Actually, far from recovering, we're waiting for our next fix. Uh, we've always been somewhat behind the rest of the world on these matters, and being spooks people, you know, we put it on hold and then we got hooked. But I've noticed that the pecking order upstairs is matched and exceeded by the pecking order downstairs. And upstairs, it's plain for everybody to see who is greatest so that the shock of verse 27 really is a shock. Who is the greater? One who reclines at table or one who serves? It clearly it's the one who reclines at table, who's served by everybody else. But, says Jesus, I am the one who is among you as the one who serves. I am the servant. I've come to establish my kingdom by being a slave. And to get a feel for how great and significant a shock it is, it's worth pausing to ponder the person and work of the Lord Jesus. So think of Jesus for a moment. Announced by angels, attended by kings, defeating Satan in the wilderness, Controlling the element, elements with just a word, driving out evil, creating life from death, walking on water, 
feeding 5,000, accompanied by multitude, teaching the masses, popular, powerful, gifted, wise, beautiful, kind, lovely. He had the ability to be the most powerful, privileged, popular man the world has ever known. He literally had creation at his fingertips. All this potential. But I am among you as the one who is a slave. So then all of this unmatched and majestic power of Jesus was to be channeled into the selfless service of the one who serves. And as Jesus points out, this makes the kingly rule of Jesus and his king radically different to all the power and influence that we find in any other institution in the world. It's beautiful, isn't it? That God, the creator of the universe, that the one who made you and made me, the one who is more powerful than anything we could ever imagine or dream of, should have at the heart of his character humility and service of others. It is beautiful. It's, we couldn't make it up. Contrast it with all the kingdoms of humanity. Think of the atheistic kingdoms of 20th century Europe and how power was grabbed and seized and people were manipulated and trampled on. And here we have the most powerful being the world has ever known presenting himself as a servant. Just tan tan tangentially, interestingly, in any culture that has been impacted big time by the gospel of Jesus, look at what it creates. So we're long since uh, a Christian country, but we still have some vestiges in the way that we call our public servants. And the ministers in the government, what does minister mean? Servant. And what is the chief minister? Oh, not a president, but a prime minister. And what do we call our armed forces but the armed services? And if only we lived up to it, it's a beautiful ideal. And what will heaven be like as the king of kings and lord of lords leads a people who are not there to get what they can out of others, but to serve? Well, now, I'm going to move straight on to the next point because I want us to tackle this in depth. Um, you'll notice there there's a very clear command to the Christian, not so with you in verse 26, which we're not going to spend time on. Let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. That's a challenge, isn't it? To be a servant in the office and a servant at home and a servant to my children and my wife, and a servant in the church. But I want us to move on to um, verse 31 and following, because it's all very well to be told that Jesus came to serve and that he was the servant, but we have to ask, for what purpose was his service? For service, simply as an end in itself, is a fairly meaningless concept. If service is to have any value, it has to have a goal and a purpose. Now, if at the end of this meeting, um, uh, somebody sitting down here uh, in, in the front, uh, let's say David, was to go to the back of the meeting and lie out on the floor, and we were all to pass out uh, walking, trampling over him, and as we trampled over him, he said, I'm serving you, I'm serving you. You know, we would be right to say, well, you're a bit of an idiot, really, because, I'm sorry, David, I shouldn't have picked you out. I should have taken myself as the example. I must apologize. But we would say that, wouldn't we? Because what purpose is it achieving? Service is only meaningful if there's actually a goal to it. And in verses 31 to 38, we see the failure of Peter, and we find the reason why Jesus came to serve. 
The ugly envy of 24 is superseded by the predicted cowardice and disloyalty of Peter in 31 and 32. And these verses show Jesus' knowledge of his lead disciple, that even he, Peter, is so spiritually weak that he is unable to stand in the face of Satan's onslaught. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. So Peter clearly wants to be part of this kingdom, but Jesus knows better and is aware of the latent cowardice and weakness in every one of us. He's conscious of our inability to stand, of our propensity to buckle, of our readiness to put up the white flag, and of our fleeing, turning and running at the faintest hint of discomfort. Uh, we want to be part of this kingdom. It's a beautiful thing. We love the idea of following the selfless servant. But on our own, it can never be. I love it that in verse 31, Jesus addresses Peter's and uses his name twice, Simon, Simon. You can picture Jesus looking lovingly into the eyes of Simon and Simon sensing that his creator can see right into the depths of his soul. Simon, Simon. He loves him. Satan has demanded to have you. I've prayed for you that you won't buckle completely, that you will turn. Me? Turn, says Peter? That'll never happen. I'm part of your kingdom. Before the cock crows three times this day, you will deny that you know me. And Jesus then goes on to quote from Isaiah 53, and he explains that he has come to fulfill absolutely everything in that chapter. And what I'd like us to do then is to turn back to page 742 in the Bible that we have on our seats and to glance at Isaiah 53 for a moment. So Jesus says, it's on page 743. So Jesus says, I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He quotes the scripture. He was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Now the chapter Jesus quotes from is the famous final servant song. And the servant in the prophet Isaiah is the figure sent by God to rescue his people from God's judgment through his sacrificial death. The verse Jesus quotes from is the final verse of the servant song. See there in verse 12, halfway through the verse, he was numbered with the transgressors. God is speaking. God explains first that he will vindicate his servant. I will divide him a portion with the many at the beginning of the verse. And then he explains why his servant is to be exalted, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressor. Now that's only one verse at the end of the servant song, but the servant song is absolutely shot through with references to the sin-bearing, sacrificial death of the servant. Have a look at verse 10. His soul makes an offering for sin. Third line. Have a look at verse 11. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Have a look at the last three lines of the song, he bore the sin of many. And that's just the conclusion of the servant song. 
So this servant song, this prophecy of Isaiah, that a servant will arise sent by God who will deal with God's judgment at our f human failure, this servant song is shot through with statements of the sacrificial suffering of Jesus, no more so than the very center of the servant song in verse 5, which you can see just across the page there. He was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Do you see the suffering? Wounded, crushed, chastised, beaten. You see the reason for our transgressions, our wandering away from God, our iniquity, our falling short of God, our hostility, our lack of peace with God, and our healing, the damage done to us and through us by our rebellion against God. And you notice the beneficiaries of the suffering for our iniquities, for our transgression, for our peace, for our healing. And Jesus takes this servant song and the final verse, and he says, this must find its fulfillment in me. I am among, among you as the one who serves, but why has he come to serve? What's the purpose of his service? For our transgression, for our iniquity, for our rebellion against God, for our healing. I remember the first time I ever began to understand why Jesus died on the cross. It was back in the Easter of 1981, 31 years ago this April. I had been recruited somewhat reluctantly to help out on the Easter holiday party. I was professing Christian faith, but up to that point, I have to confess, in my arrogance, I thought that I was doing God a bit of a favor by my church attendance and my service and my prayers and whatever it happened to be. And, and I thought, well, he must be rather pleased that I'm serving him. And I guess a little like Peter, I had no real concept of my own sinful failure to have kept any of God's commands and standards. I wanted to be part of the kingdom. I had no idea that the suffering servant had to serve me long before I ever could serve him. You cannot serve him until he has served you. You can't have membership of his kingdom until he has acted as a slave for you and dealt with your sin and your failure. And it just may be that there is someone here who is suffering from the Peter syndrome and who hasn't yet realized that you can do nothing for God until first he has washed you and served you. And so as we close, let's ponder the two specific aspects of our sinful nature that are mentioned in this passage. Envy and arrogance cowardice and disloyalty. You know, I, in my working life, I've worked in schools and hospitals for the army, for the church, and for a traveling fun fair. I never usually mention that on my CV. In every single place, I have encountered envy, pride, self-promotion. It's ugly, egocentric, destructive and totally normal. It's as prevalent upstairs as it is downstairs. It's there in the boardroom, it's there in the barrack room. We find it amongst siblings, can you believe it? And even sometime between husband and wife. We detest it and we despise it when we see it amongst others. We despair when we find it in ourselves, and it is there in ourselves, this envy and rivalry. There was a dispute among them as to who was to be the greatest. That's so normal. Do you think you can ever have a part of his kingdom before he served you and washed you clean with all that filth?
And what about the disloyalty and cowardice and the spiritual buckling? I mean, when the right thing needs to be done, do you always do the right thing? I don't. How did the atheistic horrors happen in 20th century Europe? Because so many normal people were cowardly, just didn't stand up. And isn't that true of you and me just day to day? Can we possibly be part of his kingdom before he served us? And so the king, the Lord of all, the king of kings and Lord of lords, came as the one who serves. And in his service, he came as the suffering servant to carry all of God's judgment at your failure and mine. And it means that if only we will come to him and to his cross and ask him, he will wash us clean and give us membership of this wonderful kingdom where humility, meekness, kindness, service is right at the heart of all that matters. Let's pray together. I am among you as the one who serves. We praise you, living Lord Jesus, that you were pierced for our transgressions. Every one of us, unless extraordinarily hard, will acknowledge that we have failed you time and time again. Thank you that long before we ever thought of serving you or loving you, you loved us and served us. We pray that you will wash us clean through that death of yours on the cross and fit us to serve others in this city for your name's sake. Amen.